Hi, I'm Rabbi Jeremy from Mahar. And if you've been following these videos, you know that we're now into Parshat Shoftim, the fourth of the five, count them five, Torah portions from Deuteronomy that were read in August 2020. And like with the other videos, the idea behind this, this video is just to kind of give a roundup of the Torah portions for the month because we're not doing the Torah portion roundup in our texts on Tuesday's classes. So we're on Parshat Shoftim. Parshat Shoftim is significant for a number of different reasons. First of all, it sets out an Israelite polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y, the idea that there's a structure of government that Israelite society would follow. And the basic structure of government is that you would have local judges whose job is to adjudicate cases and maybe serve as local government. If they can't solve the case, it gets moved up the food chain to the Levitical priests who would then be asked to resolve the situation. This is also the section of the Torah where we get the famous phrase, justice, justice shall you pursue, and the Hebrew is tzedek, tzedek tirdof, which just means justice, justice, or righteousness, righteousness you shall pursue. There's discussion of sacrifices, there's discussion of fighting idolatry, again, because this is a regular thing that happens in Deuteronomy. And then we get an interesting chapter. We get to chapter 17, and we get a little farther into chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, and we get the discussion of a king. And this is interesting for a number of different reasons. So we have this idea that the text says, when you appoint a king, this is interesting. So one, people are appointing a king, and usually you think that that's a dynastic thing, but it maybe isn't. When you appoint a king, almost seems as though you're supposed to appoint a king. This is really, really, really problematic. And we'll talk about why in a second. So it says, when you appoint a king, these are the things that the king needs to do. The king shouldn't accumulate horses. The king shouldn't accumulate wealth. The king shouldn't accumulate wives. The king should have a copy of this book, presumably Deuteronomy, with him all the time, and he should listen to the interpretation of it by the Levitical priests. The king shouldn't be left to interpret the Torah by himself. The king should listen to what other people tell him about the Torah. So we kind of have an executive branch. Now, the thing that's really interesting about Deuteronomy saying when you appoint a king is that other books from the Deuteronomists don't seem to think kings are good. So this book says when you appoint a king, like you're supposed to appoint a king, and this is what the king shall do. In the book of 1 Samuel, we actually have a really complicated picture of monarchy and of kingship. Because in 1 Samuel, as Samuel gets older, the Israelites ask him to appoint a king so they can be like the other nations. And the phrase, be like the other nations, is a big trigger. Big, big, big trigger for the Deuteronomists that whatever is about to happen is bad. So one Deuteronomistic school text really looks negatively at the king. And the other one seems to assume you're going to have one and gives commandments and doesn't seem to say kings are bad. In fact, it assumes that you'll have a king as part of your political structure. So this is a really interesting tension. And in fact, the book of Samuel doesn't leave this unambiguous either. So the book of Samuel has multiple stories for how Saul is appointed king. And one of them is like almost at random. And the other one is that Samuel is kind of guided to Saul. There is always the question of whether Samuel, Saul, David, who's the subsequent king, Solomon, who was after David, whether these people were real. And we have no historical evidence to say that they were real, other than we have a, a, a steely, it's a stone thing that stands up. Um, and the steely talks about the house of David. But I think the story is more complicated than that because 
if we look at the Hebrew for these names, we have something very interesting happening. So Samuel is Shmuel. That's the Hebrew for Samuel. Shmuel, Samuel's name in Hebrew, is a name given in the first chapter of Samuel by his mother, Hannah. Hannah goes to a shrine and prays to have a child. And Samuel's name means God listens. So his name is connected to the story. Saul in Hebrew is Shaul. This literally means the asked for thing, or in his case, the asked for person. Who is asking for Saul? The Israelites were asking for Saul. This should raise some alarm bells that maybe this isn't a real person. David comes after Saul. The root word of David's name, the root letters in Hebrew are Dalid Vet, Dalid Vav, not Vet, Dalid Vav Dalid. This is the same Hebrew word that produces the word uncle, Dod. Dod also means beloved. So if you've ever seen one of those rings that you could buy from the signals catalog or wherever else that says Ani le Dodi va Dodi Li, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Um, David's name is beloved. He's the beloved king as opposed to Saul. David's son who takes over is Shlomo. So Shin Lamed Mem is related to the word for Shalom. Shalom means complete in addition to peace. It means wholeness. Solomon is the one who builds the temple. Solomon is the fulfillment, the Shin Lamed Mem, the completion of the promises made to David. This makes this particular origin story for the Israelite monarchy a little suspicious, a little tricky, a little worrisome, because really all of these people conveniently had these names that are about their role in the story? Hmm. So we're kind of left with this question. And we really have to think about this question because... Samuel's mother's name is Chana. That Chet, Nun combination is similar to the Hebrew word Chen, which means favor. So Chana would have been favored. Chana was favored and produced Shmuel. God answered her prayer. Shmuel picks first Shaul, the king that people asked for, and then David, David, the people, the beloved king. David produces Solomon, Shlomo, the completion of the promise to the house of David. This makes the history a little more fraught than we might think at first. So, we have ambivalence in the Deuteron Deuteronomistic source that is reflected in other parts of Deuteronomy, but not so much here, except that the king is circumscribed in what he can do because he's supposed to follow the Torah as interpreted by the Levites. The Levites are made the judges. The Levites are also kind of essentially made a kind of legislative branch too, right? He's supposed to follow their interpretations. The king is supposed to follow their interpretations. We then move on and we get a discussion of the need to support the Levites because they don't inherit land. And then we get a discussion of how you know whether somebody's a false prophet and when you need to worry about following their instructions and when you don't. And then we get a discussion of the cities of refuge, this idea that there are cities established, there are three cities on one side of the river, three on the other. There are cities established whose function is when someone has committed an accidental homicide, and one of the examples given by the text is 
uh, an axe slips and kills somebody. They are to go to these cities of refuge, and they're to go to these cities of refuge in part, the text seems to recognize, in part because people are vindictive and these people don't deserve to die because they didn't commit murder. Murderers who go to these cities are actually supposed to essentially be extradited out. So we have these refuge, these cities of refuge and a recognition in the biblical text that the consequences of your actions and the intent of your actions maybe aren't always the same. And that suggests that sometimes punishment isn't always the same, which is a principle that actually applies in much of our justice system today. Um, we have a text that says, this is pretty interesting, don't move property boundary markers of your neighbor. It just kind of has it. And then it talks about another piece of property issues. Um, it starts to talk about what happens when you plant crops and somebody else comes and eats them. And it essentially says, okay, look, if you plant crops and somebody else comes to eat them, they have to pick them by hand. They shouldn't come in and use a, a, a scythe to sow wheat, and they shouldn't grab grapes by cutting off branches. They can just kind of nibble around the edges. You still have to be able to eat, but you are also entitled to be able to take a little bit from people because the idea that Deuteronomy has is that people shouldn't be poor. The existence of poverty is not viewed well by the book of Deuteronomy, and there are all of these things it talks about to try to alleviate the problem of poverty. How successfully any of these would work, who knows. It then talks about um, what you do when you go to war, and it distinguishes when you go to war against pretty much anybody outside your land, which means that Deuteronomy assumes that you're going to have wars with people in foreign countries. And when you are going to war against the seven tribes who occupied the land before the Israelites get there. So these are the people the Israelites are supposed to dispossess. And it says the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. When you go to war against those, you destroy everything. You kill the men, you kill the women, you kill the children, you kill the livestock. You destroy the cities. You don't keep any of the property that you might have taken as loot. Any other war, yeah, okay, you know, the men you're going to kill, but... Women you let live, children you let live, crops you let, trees you leave, buildings you leave, you take the plunder. But when it's one of these tribes, you have to wipe them out completely because you're supposed to wipe out idolatry in the land. This is called cherem. Cherem is a word that in this context means ban. So people are put in cherem they're excommunicated. This is what happened to Baruch Spinoza. He was put under the ban. He was put under cherem in the Amsterdam Jewish community, except in Spinoza's case, he didn't really want to be a member of the Jewish community, so no biggie from his perspective. But in biblical law of war, cherem is just scorched earth. Everyone is killed. This is not the book of peace that we sometimes are told the Bible is. It's a complicated picture. And then we have this last piece. What happens when you just come across a random dead human? And the answer is that there is a ritual that is to be used to sort of disclaim responsibility, to say, we came across this body we didn't do it. No one in our town did this, but we came across this body. We disposed of the body as we were told. It also involves 
killing a cow and people washing their hands and the cow's blood and then washing their hands off again. And, um, but this is all to say a strange person was found. We had no responsibility that a ritual was viewed as needing to happen to make it clear that the community that found the person did nothing wrong. This is probably useful historically in ancient Near Eastern cultures that sometimes had a focus on honor and the supposition might be this body was found dead near this other tribe's town and maybe there's a problem. And so this helps kind of ritually smooth over the conflict that could arise one potential explanation. So that was Parshat Shoftim. And we have one more Torah portion left in Deuteronomy for August 2020, Parshat Ki Tetzeh.